There we are. So, uh, Nicole, would you like to start the uh, the recording, and I will share my screen. Try that one more time with ceiling. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to, I believe, the 77th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group, uh, the second meeting of our seventh year. Uh, and uh, we're recording this meeting, so if you do not, or we were recording this meeting, Nicole, we still recording? We are. I don't see the recording thing going on here. Oh, yes. Uh, you're sh are you sure we're recording? Just to double check. Because I can't see a recording button. Yep, it says recording on mine, Anthony. Does? Okay, good. All right. It must just be my, something on my end. Okay, so welcome to the 77th monthly meeting of the SSBMG. We're recording. If you don't wish to be recorded, uh, you should leave. Uh, and um, uh, we've got a, a, a really great topic for us this afternoon, uh, which I will introduce in a moment. Uh, before I do that, uh, for those of you who don't know about us, this is your first meeting perhaps, uh, just a few words of introduction. I think most of you have attended meetings in the past, so I'm going to do this very uh, fast. The slides for today, including the ones I'm about to show, are in our Google Drive, uh, and a link to the right folder will be posted as a comment to this month's meeting post in LinkedIn. Uh, but you could also always access it at drive.ssbmg.com as it's shown on the screen uh, bottom left. Okay, so first thing uh, that we should do is uh, uh, our acknowledgement of our privilege. Uh, so as most of you know, uh, in Canada, we've had a Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission a few years ago now uh, to explore how to uh, get to reconciliation with the First Peoples of Canada. Uh, and um, so out of that came uh, uh, over 90 recommendations. And one of those recommendations, one of the smaller ones, was that we ought to acknowledge at public events such as this, um, our privilege as settlers of being on land that uh, was somebody else's originally. Um, and uh, so obviously this is a global meeting and that context doesn't necessarily apply to everybody. So this is a globalized version of that idea. And it's really, uh, from a strongly sustainable perspective, from a flourishing perspective, uh, just an acknowledgement of, of respect that we have uh, for the people uh, that are original to the places that we're all in. So uh, as an overall comment, this is a is sacred land on which each of us are privileged to be. And this land by lakes and sea has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge and tradition. We're privileged to be the beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and beyond. And we invite you to consider in your place how you honour and peoples indigenous to your place. And today, each place around the world is increasingly home to peoples from across the world. And we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. So that's a kind of socio-geographic um, uh, acknowledgement. Uh, but there's another acknowledgement that we also like to make because strong sustainability is not only about the social dimension, it's also about the biophysical dimension. Uh, and uh, so we ought to recognise place. So uh, the building that uh, is shown in the photograph here is where we're not actually today because we're doing this meeting entirely virtually. Uh, but that's where we would be normally in OCAD's main building on the Fall Street in downtown Toronto. Uh, and uh, so I would ask you to think about which watershed you're in today. Which watershed is this building in uh, that we would normally be in? By the way, we're not in that meeting because of the storm going on outside. Yeah. And we've had, you know, uh, 15 meters of snow already today, six inches for those of you so inclined to measure things that way. So uh, have a think about which watershed in it. If you don't know, uh, maybe go and look it up because you're interdependent with the place you're in biophysically. So it's kind of an important thing to know. Uh, for those of us uh, who would normally be in the room in at 100 McCall Street, we're uh, in a watershed called by settlers Russell Creek. Uh, we buried it in the 1870s because we polluted it so badly. 
uh, and uh, I've been looking for the indigenous name for this and I haven't managed to find it, but Cathy tells me she's on the, she's on the hunt for the uh, indigenous name for uh, Russell Creek. Um, and uh, delivery of this session is important in important ways. If you visit the bathroom, uh, then you're directly using the ecosystem service provided by the watershed. And if you're using the Flourishing Business Canvas, one of the tools produced by members of this project, uh, this, of this group, uh, then you'll be able to think about your interaction with um, through the uh, biophysical stocks and ecosystem services questions that the Flourishing Business Canvas asks. Uh, so who's the SSBMG? Uh, as of uh, a few minutes ago, we were just over 1,490 people. So we've added uh, about 25 people since our last meeting. Uh, and uh, we are the world's first only group taking action to undertake enterprise strategy and to do organizational design action research from a micro ecological economic perspective. So ecological economics is where we get this term strongly sustainable from. If you want to know more about strong sustainability, the Wikipedia article is quite good. Uh, as a basic introduction. So we're, we're not looking at it from a macroeconomic perspective, we're looking at it from an organization, a micro perspective. Uh, we use systemic design uh, as our primary way of undertaking research and practice. Uh, systemic design, if you want to know more about that, go look up the Systemic Design Research Network, uh, which it was uh, co-founded by uh, Peter Jones, one of the co-founders of this group, and a number of others. Uh, we also differentiate ourselves because we have a strong purpose. We're not just here to do some action research about strong sustainability is an ab abstract idea. Uh, we actually want to enable organizations globally to start to flourish as organizations and to contribute to the possibility that we, that human and all other life will flourish on this planet for seven generations. So we're, we're not your average academic research group. We actually have a very practical uh, objective and set of values to support that objective in the world. So we get you, we hope, uh, we hope this is, things that resonate with you and that you all want and are all working in your own context to bring about and therefore we think we hope that you found your community your home uh, to share and to uh, build the work that needs to be done to create these outcomes uh, so our members put into practice uh, and do action research around the latest ideas uh, and as I said we offer a global network of possibilities for education research and increasingly employment um, I won't go through the group's goals in any detail if if you'd like to look at these, the wiki uh, is the place to go and look at, and the link's there at the bottom. Uh, we're part, we're not just a small little standalone group. Uh, we are part of a global planetary movement towards uh, not only enterprise flourishing, but human flourishing at the biggest uh, level. And uh, these are some logos of some of the other organizations that are in our planetary movement. And of course, this builds on the SDGs. The SDGs are an amazing gift to humanity from ourselves to ourselves. Uh, but they don't go far enough. They're not sufficiently aligned with the science, uh, which is again another reason why we call ourselves strongly sustainable. We're, we're, we're going beyond sustainable development, which is weak sustainability. Uh, and uh, so, yes, we support the SDGs. Yes, we think they're a critical enabler for moving towards flourishing, but we need to go beyond the SDGs. And there's some ideas we've got about how we could do that, which if you look at this deck towards the end, you'll see some of those ideas. Uh, we have multiple projects of our members. Uh, for our members, by our members, uh, and uh, some of these are the Future Fit Business Benchmark, uh, Lean for Flourishing Startups, Refocus on Sustainability, the Flourishing Enterprise Innovation Toolkit, uh, Reporting 3.0, uh, Aim to Flourish, and we have a number of others that are in various stages of being convened by some of our members. Any member can start a project, and uh, our community animators, Nicole and Kathy, can help you with that. Uh, and um, Basically, it's a question of just getting, starting to convene the group, get, figuring out what people are interested in around the topic you're interested in and, and starting to move that forward. All of these projects on here have come about and have different stories about how they came about. Uh, but at some point, somebody put up their hand and said, we need this in the world and uh, convened other people around them to, to move it forward. Uh, just to let you know some other things to connections and community and partnerships. Uh, so if you want to understand the field as a whole, this is a great paper by uh, our blog master, Florian Ludek Freud. Florian, uh, I'll mention Florian again in a moment if you want to take a look at this article. Uh, Systemic Design mentioned this already. Uh, this is the way we do our research and our practice. And so the next conference that they're holding is in October in Chicago. Hopefully see many of you there. Uh, we also, uh, many of us will be at the International New Business Models Conference in Berlin. Uh, in, actually, that date's wrong. 
uh, Nepal, that should be July 1st through 3rd. Uh, and uh, we, we've also been working on uh, the new business models blueprint uh, with reporting 3.0 that was launched almost a year ago now. Uh, and so that's now out there in the world. Uh, our blog is maintained also by Florian. Oh, and the new business models conference has also been organized by Florian. Uh, we also have a relationship with the Institute for Revolutionary Leadership in California. Um, and we also have a number of our members who are heavily involved in the Benefit Corporation academic community movement. Uh, and last but not least, in Canada, we have a connection to the Academy for Sustainable Innovation. So uh, with all of that said, I'm going to skip over all of this. Uh, the purpose of these monthly meetings is an opportunity for our members to share their work with each other, uh, to inspire new thinking, to make connections. Uh, and so these are just some of the, the recent presentations that we've had. Uh, and I'll introduce our, our uh, speaker for this month in, in just a moment. Um, if anybody would like to present, uh, then uh, please connect with our community animators. Schedule, uh, uh, and uh, we're taking bookings now uh, for I think we said July onwards at the moment. Um, we may have a gap between now and July, but uh, uh, July onwards. So if you're interested in speaking, uh, then uh, please make that known to Kathy. Uh, so I won't go through this. So moving on to today's speaker. Uh, so uh, uh, I met Eric um, uh, virtually about two years ago now, just coming up on two years ago. Eric was uh, doing an MBA in the Netherlands, and I'll let him explain a little bit more about that. Um, and he was asking me questions about the Flourishing Business Canvas, which, as many of you know, I'm the convener of that uh, project of our of the members of this group, um, and wanted to think about using it somehow in some research that he was doing in the field of energy innovation. Uh, in the Netherlands. And so uh, he uh, proceeded to do his master's thesis uh, in this space of energy uh, startups, energy innovation uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, when he sent me his master's thesis uh, last summer, when it was all done, uh, I read it and went, wow, this is really interesting. Members of the group would be really interested to hear more about this. And so uh, that is the purpose of today's project, to give Eric a chance, uh, as we've given to many other graduate students to share their research and practice uh, with our members uh, and to uh, potentially make connections in terms of what they could do next, uh, what the community could do next with the new ideas that uh, have been shared. So with that, Eric, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and allow you to share yours and uh, hand it over to you. In terms of Q&A, uh, typically uh, you can uh, Eric, are you happy for interruptions as you go along, or would you prefer people to use the chat, or how would you prefer to do it? Both are completely fine. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, use the chat if you'd like, uh, or just interrupt uh, as, uh, as we go. So, Eric, if you'd like to share your presentation with us. So hopefully it's coming through properly this time, and uh, yes. no chat window or anything? That's, we can see it perfectly. Perfect. So thank you very much for the introduction, Anthony. Thank you everyone for being here today as well. Um, wanted to walk you through my uh, overview of my thesis, which is, uh, as you can see from the title, focused on context-based design and focused on an innovation center in the energy transition. Um, so first of all, uh, just a few recognitions, thank yous uh, to my supervisors in this. Um, this was at a university in Netherlands. My wife is doing her PhD here, so I got the opportunity to come here and do my MBA here. Uh, so Dr. Egbert Dommerholt and Dr. Arne Mertens were my supervisors. Um, and then, as I'll tell you more in a moment, I worked with TNO as well as TNO HESI, which is the uh, largest research organization in the Netherlands, and this is one of their lab facilities um, and innovation center. And that was with Henk Ensing and Jeroen Vandenberg. Um, and then I also interviewed uh, quite a few people for my research, so many thanks to them as well. Um, building on the recognition as per what Anthony did, I'm presenting from Edmonton, Canada, where I'm visiting my family right now. I'm from here, uh, which is Treaty 6 territory, and our watershed is the North Saskatchewan River. Uh, so what we'll cover today is the, uh, go through an introduction to the research, kind of walk you through um, the approach I took and kind of the, the journey along the research, uh, then tell you a bit about my methodology, uh, go into the basic overview of the findings and analysis, and then uh, conclusions, recommendations, and of course, the discussion at the end. So based on that, um, giving a 
snapshot of um, the path I took on setting up this research. Many thanks to my supervisors and TNO for guiding it. I got an opportunity to do an internship with TNO HESI specifically, and that's the Hybrid Energy Systems Integration Facility. Uh, what they do is they're located um, in the entrance facility. It's an energy transition center, and uh, they provide a place that people can come to, um, use their test facility to test new innovations in energy transition, and um, also provide support along with the resources of TNO as a research center to help the energy transition, lots of supporting software systems, so on and so forth. Um, so with that, they were, they're actually quite new. They started, I guess, three years ago now, um, formally. And then they were looking to find better ways of structuring their business model to attract people. Um, and one of the factors, they did already have a business model based on the business model canvas. Um, so they're wondering how they can do better. And additionally, they're in the energy transition. That's all about a move towards sustainability. So is the business model canvas even right for that? It's traditionally more for money. So that's, that's kind of what framed out the um, drive to bring me on board to help them out with the business model. So first of all, setting out some terminology, um, make sure we're all on the same page. Obviously there's lots of different ideas of what context could mean for the purpose of this research. I just defined it as a business focus for it and defining the context of the elements of an organization and its environment that may influence the components and relationships um, that's needed for a business model architecture, which I'll define in a moment. But it's really looking at what, what do we need to consider for it. Uh, and then context-based design is with that context, recognizing how that's going to influence the creation of um, business model elements, be it, or, or sorry, elements for business, be it a business model um, or other aspects you're creating. And that's again, what do we need to consider when designing these various elements you can use in strategy. Uh, the business model itself, um, what I use for the definition is uh, the definition by Tease um, back in 2010, which was it's the, for business, it's the designer architecture of the value creation delivery and capture mechanisms in place. There's lots of definitions for business models. Um, and I think relevantly for this group, because it's all about business models, um, this is trying to take what is generally accepted as the business model definition based on, there's an article by Foss and Sabi, uh, two articles by them, um, and that's just showing everything seems to be converging to that definition. I know there are some people in the room who have new and updated and potentially even better definitions, but I thought this definition was good to provide a bit of an objective and, and quote unquote, standardized definitions that we could then look into. Um, last quick things to define is the business model architecture. I define this as kind of the framework. So uh, using a term that's mentioned, the flourishing business canvas could be considered an architecture. Um, and then the business model itself is how a company is recognizing that. So just to differentiate between um, what we're referring to in these terms. Uh, sustainable business models is of course the new field uh, per Ludico Frun and Dembeck's article. It's really an emerging field, lots of new research in it. And um, just tried to pick a definition of that from Nancy Bakken, which is that these models capture economic, social, and environmental value for a wide range of stakeholders. So quickly framing out what I hope to um, deliver in this presentation is uh, to recognize the importance of um, context in business model architectures when you're designing them and also guidance, which I'll talk to you more about later, on how context can really influence those aspects. Also, when even creating these business model architectures, there's some real foundational elements that you need to consider um, when creating them. We'll also overview some of those. Um, and quite a few of those are based on ontologies that have been developed for business models. Uh, and lastly is, uh, many people here probably not in innovation centers in the energy transition, as I well know from knowing some people already. Um, however, I think there are some key elements that may still be valuable. Um, and the reason I say that is because an innovation center is all about bringing people together, connecting ideas, giving tools, support, other resources to help those people with their innovations as well. So I, I think there are some overlaps on any of us who are helping bring people together and provide support um, through innovations, especially towards sustainability, towards flourishing. Um, 
so walking through kind of how my supervisors, myself, and people at Taino kind of structured this research is we first went, okay, well, we were using the business model canvas, but let's take a step back and go, what, what is even the right business model architecture, the framework, the structure that, that we should be using for it? And there's a lot out there, um, and most of them are monetary focused for, again, the business model canvas. Um, additionally, just from looking around, there did not seem to be anything specifically de designed for innovation center in the energy transition. Um, and actually, if you look in general, most seem to either not consider how context has an influence or just consider limited elements. And maybe using the business model canvas as an example again, it was originally built for e-businesses um, and then generalized. So it, it kind of brings up the question, okay, well, are we sure these are the best fit for it? Um, and then, of course, again, there are many existing and some of them may be good for it, but especially since this is a research project, we decided to take a step back and go, well, okay, let's, let's look at if we tried to design an architecture for this specific context, what would we end up with? Um, how could we break it apart and really um, potentially create something entirely new or end up similar to something existing and find out that that's the certain specific existing architecture is the best fit for this context. Um, so from there, we also need to look at Qu question, question for you. What, what, um, what, what was the context for this question getting asked? Um, what, what, what caused the question to arise um, that was going on in, in TNO and HESI specifically that caused people to wonder um, about this question? Yeah, and um, so this is an interesting question with a very complex answer. We, we did actually start using um, the uh, some existing sustainable business model canvases um, in our work already while I was doing this research in parallel. A lot of it was brought in from um, discussions with my supervisor who was actually doing research on the business model components themselves um, and saying, you know, we need to consider there's a broader set of business model components. So um, kind of from this straight business perspective, we did already start running with some existing, otherwise it would have taken too long to wait for the entire research. However, uh, from a research perspective, because especially with my supervisor, we've been talking a lot about what's out there even, and, and let's really take a deeper look at components and their interrelationships. That's where, um, I guess mostly it was, we were interested in looking deeper into it. Um, there, there was some sort of a gut feel that there was a gap between yeah. current and current tools and what felt yeah, exactly. like would be most useful or appropriate given the energy transition focus of TNO HESI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. The, again, there, there's nothing specifically built with research towards that. I mean, most examples you have are for you know, be it manufacturing or something like that. So is this different? Is this really different? Um, yes, so the last thing on it is when we were exploring this in architecture, we also looked at what are the elements of context. Okay, great. So context guides it, so on and so forth. Um, but what does that even mean? What context? What, what's relevant? What's not relevant? Um, so something considered in the research as well is what are elements of context and how does that even influence our design process? So um, the first step into it was again, recognizing the energy transition itself is focused on sustainability. Um, and additionally, worldwide, we do actually need to make a transition towards sustainability as well. Our current monetary only focus is causing major worldwide problems. So based on that, we decided to take a look at what are sustainable business models that already exist and um, could any of them be relevant? Uh, when looking at those, again, they weren't specifically designed with any um, specific context in, in mind. Uh, so with that, it was, okay, well, again, we found something that seems closer because we need sustainability. So already we have one layer of focus um, for these architectures. However, again, they still haven't taken energy innovation center and the energy transition into mind. Therefore, again, 
can we find something that's a better fit? Always in business research, we definitely like our acronyms, maybe a little bit too much. So using the acronyms for these is the Business um, Innovation Kit, the Flourishing Business Canvas, and the Triple Layer Business Model Canvas. Um, I'll show those again in a slide in a moment here. Um, but those are the currently recognized, or at least at the time of this research, main sustainable business models that provide components and interrelationships. Um, and that's kind of what we define throughout this on business model architectures is really recognizing that there need to be components and interrelationships and um, a structure that we can really look at. Um, so following the approach of the ontologies of uh, Upward and Jones, as well as uh, Osterwalder and Bigner, uh, what they did, uh, specifically the ontologies from Osterwalder as well as Upward, but uh, what they did is they first looked at what are existing architectures and how can we learn from them when we're designing our components. So now we're at the next stage of our architectural creation process, shall we call it, and going, how do we build a new architecture? Uh, let's look at what exists and maybe that can form a, us with some good ideas on what to create. So that's where again, okay, we already have the um, existing sustainable business models that were identified, so potentially we can use those. And that then leads into this research question of what are in this architecture we're cre creating the components and interrelationships um, for an innovation center in the energy transition and the corresponding sub, uh, sub research questions. Um, if you're interested, go, we can come back to them, but uh, instead of reading up from the slide, I'll just pause for a moment. So the conceptual framework um, built this on is again recognizing for that business model architecture, uh, there's really the components and interrelationships that are part of it, um, which is then borrowing ideas from uh, Bruin Luke Frun. Uh, there's the values that kind of guide that business model itself and can give information on how you're approaching it, how you're dealing with it. Uh, this is primarily from their book, uh, The Values-Based Innovation. Uh, and then framing around all of that is your context. So what is relevant for what you're working on? And maybe a quick example as to why values is embedded within context is, um, for example, if you're in a area where sustainability is just not important at all, then potentially that doesn't become a value for you. Context is going to shape probably what you believe in, where you end up and where your business is operating. Uh, throughout this research, we also looked at values in a business perspective. There's personal values. Um, I usually look at it more from the organizational values perspective. Uh, so again, looping back towards... Um, so, so Eric, just, just, just to be certain, can you just go back one slide? So you're saying that when you were looking at the components, you were thinking about not just generically, you were actually starting to think about it specifically because it, you're in the energy, it's in the energy sector, for example. W were there any other specific uh, framings that you took for the components other than energy? Were there any other sector considerations or groups or, or um, issues or places? I guess energy is an issue as well. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So the elements of context, effectively. Um, yeah, yeah. So good question, and that's, that's coming up pretty much. So... Uh, maybe just to recap my uh, research approach, it was kind of going, okay, we know we need to design a new architecture, uh, which is going to be the components and interrelationships. We know we need context, which is the elements of context. Um, we had some basic ideas from initial research, what those could be, but most of it, we tried to keep it very open-ended um, when we were going to the interviewees to say, what do you think? Uh, what, what is influencing this? And during discussions as well, trying to come it up uh, to come out with what are those uh, elements of context. So great question. And yes, that's coming up um, to define it further. I guess the initial ones we usually approached it in is just innovation center and energy transition. We knew it was in, those were probably frames for that. Just, just, for, the, just for everybody, uh, one of the things that we've recognized over the years in the group is that um, very often because we're starting for this macro and very um, scientific basis, um, we come up with some really very powerful ideas. But the challenge we run into is that, and 
those ideas that aren't recognized as useful in by, by practitioners who are operating in, in a particular sector, who are m most closely aligned with a particular group like an entrepreneur or a, a senior manager of an existing business. Uh, they're not uh, aligned well with the way a particular issue would think about it, whether it's energy or climate change or biodiversity loss or income inequality. And, and they're not very well aligned with place. So, you know, a rural environment versus an urban environment or um, a, a, a desert biome versus a, a, a plains or prairie biome. So th this question of context um, is, I, I would say, probably half the work of the group at the moment is focused on trying to take some of the basic research and practice that we've developed and figure out how it needs to be adapted or changed in a particular sector group issue or place. So that's what prompted me to ask the question. And so we, we're very interested in people who are doing this contextualization work of some of the research that we've already done. So if you've got things to share on that, then please talk with Cathy and, and Nicole. Sorry, Eric, I took some of your time. Go ahead. Oh, and that's great. I was, I was hoping those would be introduced at some point, um, the sector group issue in place. Um, and I'm hoping we can discuss that again at the end when I introduce the uh, elements of context and how I think they could be uh, categorized. Um, so hopefully we'll loop back on that too. Um, just giving an overview again, uh, these were the elements I was referring to before. So again, this is a fundamental part of the research is going, what are the existing components um, that could build this architecture? Uh, and drew from these, uh, and this is here, um, and then also looking towards interrelationships. Now, within those, uh, the only one that really references interrelationships and actually research in general, there's only seemingly two um, that specifically identify is the ontology uh, for the flourishing business canvas or strong sustainable business model canvas at the time, um, and the research by Osterwalder for a business model canvas as well. Uh, there's ontologies behind, which reference all the interrelationships. Uh, interestingly, there didn't seem to be reference to that in Business Innovation Kit, Triple Air Business Model Canvas, except that they were based on the Business Model Canvas. Um, and this seemed to be a fairly common trend in uh, business model research in general. So I tried to comment to that, which will come up again later in the discussion here. But again, that framing of what are the components and what are the links between them, the interrelationships, that was the real structure um, for the research. And here are the existing components. What would we do different? What could be new? And we'll see how that was posed for the interviewees. Another aspect for it, those two same ontologies, what they did is identified that um, really the core of business model, shall we say, is based on the balanced scorecard in terms of looking at perspectives. And the idea of that is what covers the areas of the company. Um, so at the research, I tried to frame all the learnings into those four perspectives. Um, and to make sure it fits. And the, the whole idea of that, as I understood it for the business model is, is if you're presenting a business model architecture and then business model from it for an organization, how do you ensure you're covering all the areas of your business? So if you're building a new architecture, as we are in this research, um, then how do you ensure you're covering all the areas of a business? Because if you just forget about these perspectives um, and don't cover one of these areas, well then theoretically you're forgetting a whole part of your business and that usually doesn't end well. Um, so the ones I'm presenting here are the adaptation of the balance scorecard um, from um, Jones and Upper 2014, uh, whereas the Osterwalder paper had the original balance scorecard for perspectives. Uh, sorry, just quickly reading. I don't think those were questions. Ah, okay, that's description from Anthony, I think, giving clarification. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so just quickly answering some questions. I did not look at Carol Sansford's work, I don't think. Um, if there, I, I was mostly looking at peer reviewed articles. Was there an article from it there? Maybe I'll, I'll leave to answer in the chat or you can jump in if you want. Uh, so going through the methodology I used uh, for this research was, um, Again, recognizing that sustainability is a new and very fast developing area. 
uh, as well as in context space itself, there's um, limited research on context. So because of that, it was fairly obvious it was exploratory research and there wasn't much existing on it, kind of testing into the waters here. Um, and that's where really tried to gather perspectives from interviewees, as well as trying to run the balance of trying to give some initial information to help people understand the topic, understand there's quite a few new terms, especially in the field of sustainability, which is so rapidly emerging. Um, so trying to give some to help guide it, um, but also leave it open for new ideas. And then there are some ideas we were playing around with, such as Delphi method or um, grounded theory in terms of Delphi. Well, we're not just building a ranked list. I mean, for business model research, it's not, okay, most important is this, then this, then this, then this. It, it really depends on the business, it depends on what you're doing. Um, so that's where, again, we thought interview, semi-structured interviews was uh, the best approach, finding experts. Um, and then in terms of things like grounded theory, tried to again let things emerge, but didn't follow full ground theory because, um, again, trying to give some terms, some ideas, especially since there's already existing components that can inform us when we're developing it. So that was the approach we took. Um, so interpretivist approach and qualitative. Ah, thank you for the link. Uh, I did not look at that, um, and I'd be interested in your thoughts later as to how you think that could inform, be different, or affect the research. Uh, just to give a quick overview of the interviewees, um, was there was 10 interviews for the research, um, most of whom were in the Netherlands. Uh, that's our context, so I, we didn't define that as an element of context at first because maybe that wasn't relevant, but we wanted to see um, how that would impact. And then I'll show you later how we did determine that does have an influence. Um, lots of uh, very senior people, uh, people in the fields of energy transition, sustainability, um, so that helped with the approach. Um, after this conversation how, about... How, how did those experts react to you asking them, that, trying to engage them on this topic of business models? Were they going, were, were they was it a surprise to them that TNO Hesse and you were interested in this topic? Was it something they were very interested in? And uh, what, what was their mindset as you approached them? Yeah, and that's an interesting question. They, um, I, don't see, I don't think any of them were specifically surprised um, or, or confused on it. More, I think they were trying to grasp a lot of the new terms of sustainable business models and, and a lot of these new ideas. Um, I, I think overall they were more excited towards it, especially on the recognition of the importance of sustainability. That was, that was a very common theme throughout. Now, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a biased group. It's you know, call it whatever you like, but um, these are all people working in the energy transition or some people I talked to who are specifically in the field of sustainability and sustainability research. So again, with the point, if you're in the energy transition, you're in the field of sustainability. Um, so, I think that aligned with people very, very quickly. Um, because often we find that sustainability practitioners aren't designers. And so the idea and, you know, the, the primary value of, of having an artifact like a canvas that you can use as the focus of your design activity is if you are recognizing you are actually doing design. It, so, so sometimes even sustainability people don't see the value of business modeling. Okay, sure. That's a good point. Um, so maybe two points on that then. In general, they, they found it very effective. Um, a couple of people were not as familiar with business models. Uh, they, I, I think they could all comment towards um, what though would be important for an innovation center in the energy transition. So because of that, I, I think everyone aligned quite quickly with the idea of the importance of business modeling and commenting towards it. Um, also, uh, several of them had already worked with business models. So they were quite familiar with it. Mm -hmm. uh, to the point of designers in it, it yes. And uh, to do further research on it, if I were to do it again, yeah, potentially include some more people with design thinking towards how to build it. Um, again, most of that approach I took just building from how I saw the ontologies building the previous um, business models. So trying to follow the same sort of structure. Um, could there be different, better ways to do it? Potentially. Um, 
or, or could I have missed things within that? Absolutely. Mm. Again, just trying to follow the, okay, let's break it down to components and relationships. So, so, so just to make a fine distinction here, um, so I, I've, I've often found that even people who are sustainability people who recognize that we need a transition in business models um, are still not willing to engage with business models as, a, as an artifact that you can purposefully design. Now, now in, the, in the European context, and Holland is a, is a hotbed for design thinking in general, I would say. So, but your experts, I don't think, were just Dutch. So did, did you, did they, you, you're, you're saying, I think, I'm just to clarify your answer, you're, you're saying that they were sustainability people who understood business model redesign as a, uh, coming up with new business models was an important thing, and they recognized that that meant that there had to be a design activity that needed a tool that could support that design activity like a canvas of some description. Potentially, just, just to make sure I'm understanding because what we were designing was the architecture. Yes. Um, based on the context. So we weren't designing for the specific company as much, although of course it was a primary right. approach. But, but, the, but the, the, the experts were, were anticipating that they could use the output from your research in, in order that they could do a better job of designing for specific companies whose uh, new products that were going to support the energy transition were being tested in the lab, right? I mean, that, that was the, the framing for it. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so nothing explicit on it, but I, I think people accepted that and went with it readily. Interesting. Interesting. Cool. And to me, that's apparent through the huge amount of guidance, which we'll see later, uh, that people gave per component. Yes. Uh, I'm seeing quite a bit of chat about the balanced scorecard. Um, if it makes sense, we can come back to that at the end of the presentation. Um, I'm assuming it's more relevant. But jump in if you think differently. Um, so a lot of this we just covered in the discussion, but uh, just to emphasize why these people were um, relevant in the field. And that was a big point of the research is trying to ensure, okay, well, I mean, we're not just picking anyone who might be able to inform. These are people who are very, uh, senior in their respective areas. I tried to also select a diverse group of people. I mean, if you only pick, you know, the managers of certain facilities and everyone has the same viewpoint, probably not, but um, then that can also impact your design. So try to pick from different viewpoints, um, some more from business modeling perspective, some from the more research perspectives, from uh, the management level. Uh, we can hear Anthony furiously typing. So, uh, okay, sure. <laughs> we'll see if there's questions. But, uh, and then just to um, hopefully improve validity and reliability, I pilot tested the interviews a few times um, just to see, make sure everyone was understanding. Um, I did again provide some pre interview information, ideas only, trying to really give space to um, people come up with their own ideas. Again, recognizing that, of course, can affect the discussion somehow, but because there's so many new terms, I thought it was still worthwhile to give some idea in advance. Uh, and then sent the transcripts afterwards to interviewees, who then uh, just had some minor changes on them. Uh, the analysis process, uh, just to go through this uh, quickly so we can move to the next part, but let me know if you have any questions. Uh, using Atlas TI um, for doing the coding. Again, it's qualitative and so built those codes based on, again, the building blocks, as I saw it, for a business model. First of all, understanding what the context is, then looking at components and interrelationships. Um, and again, giving the space for new ideas to emerge, so not being completely locked into what those components may be. Um, just giving a more detailed description of those is, after the elements of context, try to really list them out so then we could have something at the end that we could really look at for, okay, it's this element, this element, this element. Um, and interestingly, there is guidance towards understanding those or interpreting those. Um, for the components, came up with you know, positive, negative, or guidance, which came up as a very major approach. I was expecting more positive and negative, but we'll see again later. Uh, there is a lot of guidance on how to understand these components. Uh, and then interrelationships, for showing the links between. Um, then there is general concepts, such as one that came up very frequently, which was to keep it simple. So if you have a architecture with 50 components, 
um, the idea was, okay, again, these are companies using it. It's going to become um, unfeasible for them to be able to actually action on this. So uh, there was some general advice given for business models. Uh, here's some examples of the coding. Um, I'll move through it after, but just to show how the quotes were then ascribed to the certain components and partnerships. There's, of course, some interpretation and uh, allocation towards it, but tried to match it based on the words provided and what seems to be best fit. So what came out of this, um, kind of now connecting back towards the previous discussion of uh, elements of context, we discovered there's innovation center and retransition, and then the concept of institutions. So just taking a second to rephrase that more generally is kind of looking at the type of company, the industry or sector, and, and institutions as a general concept. Um, what I tried to define to people in advance, this is institutions, um, I guess as defined, I viewed it as the definition by Notabum. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, but it was uh, values, norms, lifestyle, and habits. Um, and th this was a very interesting um, discussion. And I think this was very early. So I'd imagine more research on this would reveal many more things. But it was some of the things discussed during the interviews were it was like, okay, first world perspective and the economic situation, cultural aspects would all have an influence. And examples given for the energy transition would be, okay, if you're in a first world, <laughs> those were the words used. <laughs> I think we have better wording for it. But if, if you're in an environment with a very developed uh, energy infrastructure, how you approach the energy transition is presumably going to be very different than a country which does not have a highly developed energy infrastructure. Um, and many more viewpoints like that. So um, economic situation came up. It, it'd be curious again to see how much of these are just in the moment or not. But um, an example that occurred there was, okay, if you're in a very tight economy, suddenly the interest in things like sustainability are no longer first and foremost, where <laughs> having done work with others, you can still make many cases for why it's worthwhile. Um, but this was again, all looking for things that could influence um, your business model architecture or the guidance provided for it. Um, so just recognizing if you're going into a place where uh, it's doing economically very well, or if you're going to a place that has been economically having a lot of difficulties for a long time, you may need to fundamentally think differently about how you're approaching the business model. Now, again, this research was just for one context, right? So if there is, uh, and there is some other research for other contexts, um, it'd be interesting to compare it to see, okay, how much of a difference does that make between those? Do you see a noticeable difference? Um, this is again from the perspective of this research. These were things mentioned and mentioned in terms of this would have a difference. So uh, another factor on understanding these elements of context really saw it as two things, which was kind of general elements of context. So this is what frames the overall architecture. Um, and maybe using an example on that is what we see from Upward and Jones on your social, environmental, economic. Um, but then you have specific elements of context, which are the ones listed above. So this is where it's trying to recognize between your general elements, which are, okay, you know, you're, you're, we all live on the same planet. That's something that's going to influence all organizations. You have to be aware of the environment. But then you have your type of company, which is specific, and that's going to differentiate between types of companies. So this is really trying to understand how context is going to influence. Um, then also try to look at it throughout on how it will influence the business model architecture. One is on the structural layer or components and interrelationships. Um, and then the second part is how we understand those components and relationships. And that was primarily through guidance. So just to understand based on those components, that's then how we see it in our next part, which is um, the guidance and ideas that were delivered. So throughout all of this, um, it really, these discussions with interviews morphed into being a lot more about the, the guidance ideas. Again, originally it was kind of thought to be more about, okay, does this component fit or not? Um, but this, this whole discussion emerged about how do you actually understand those components? And then there were some real themes that emerged from it, uh, which kind of gets towards more of the meta level, um, but I think it's still relevant for this discussion because Again, we're trying to find ways to make this practical for companies, practical for organizations. So I see this as going 
overall guides that maybe you could be providing or however you deliver this by saying, keep this in mind when you're considering the guidance per component and so on and so forth. Um, and that was, again, be a leader, um, diversity of stakeholders and connections. And I think just to, to even summarize this unto itself is, I think looping back to why the business model canvas kind of wasn't a fit and kind of the kickoff of this whole research at the beginning, because this is an innovation center in the energy transition on one hand, like it's a test facility, right? You can have people come into the lab, you can do a transaction with them, here's the lab, use it. You know, here's our cost per hour to do a support. And you, you can just do straight up monetary perspective. Um, now, I mean, you may do better monetarily as well by being a leader and so on and so forth, but uh, as I viewed it, um, and I think as all of us viewed it for this research was, as soon as you start moving towards these perspectives, especially because you're in a field that's related to sustainability, you have to consider more than just financial. Because again, you can have just transaction, people come in, use your facility, or you can go, well, hang on, we can do better than that. We can do something more important. For one, I mean, we'll probably get more customers too. They'll probably do better financially, more partners, so on and so forth. And we're also going to make more difference in the energy transition, which is kind of what our objective is. That's that's our goal. So let's do better than just straight up, you know, give us money, here's the facility, let's actually be a leader. Um, and that, that kind of flowed into all the rest of these recommendations on diversity connections um, by saying, how are you a leader? You need to be really looking at who you're connecting to, getting a diverse set of people. And there's a lot of discussion from the interviewees about how broadly you can go with your set of stakeholders while still keeping in mind why you're including them and making sure they are helping you and everyone in your you know, effectively community to work together. Um, you're not just doing diversity for the sake of diversity. You need to focus on that. However, really think big picture. Um, and also recognizing, which is a point brought up by some of the interviews, that your context may change. So this whole idea of contextual elements and so on and so forth is not to lock people in. Um, and that, that was actually a big point a couple people made about this research. Okay, we're now we're defining another factor. Don't lock ourselves into the thinking that that's the only, um, you know, here's the only elements of context and now you only fit into these categories. We'll just recognize that can change over time for your company. And additionally, with, with research and so on and so forth, we, we likely find other ideas towards uh, context as well. Um, so then we came up with guidance per component um, and I think a certain person in the room will be happy to know that the components that seem to be the best fit were the flourishing business canvas um, for the discussion. So uh, that's where there, there was discussion in quite a few different areas. Most of it seemed to fit into it. So because of experience with this model canvas, something like customer segments came up some, that is all incorporated into the Fortune Business Canvas. So a lot of those rolled in, especially with support from practically all the interviews of the importance of stakeholders. Just using an example as to how some interpretation was used and some combination. However, it did all seem to fit best towards Fortune Business Canvas. However, and this may be only because it was an innovation center in the energy transition, the one concept from the Business Innovation Kit of values did seem worthwhile here. Um, and that's where there was the component of goals in the flourishing business canvas that didn't, in this context anyways, seem to be enough. Um, that recognition of values, and especially as brought up by many interviewees, the values as connected to the values of stakeholders and really the combination you can um, do on idea generation. And, and that may have been one of the main reasons for it is because it's an innovation center. If you can get values alignment, um, for many interviewees, as well as for uh, the research on the values-based innovation, um, that's a very important concept. And that seemed to be something that was missing um, for the flourishing business canvas. So be it as a, a side add-on or be it as actually integrated as part of it. Um, in my case, I did recommend um, it be integrated into the canvas itself because it does provide a lot of guidance throughout uh, each of the different components. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting, uh, we, we've gone back, in, in the toolkit project, we've gone backwards and forwards on this question a few times, and Nick, Nicole will recognise that this is the conversation we had with Peter Jones uh, last week, in terms of, you know, wh where do you draw the edge around the tool? How do you decide if adding something is really just overcomplicating it versus uh, by adding more stuff versus making it more useful by integrating different things together it's it's a from a tool design perspective it, there's no there's no good answer to it so I, on, on dean uh, and i in our work with startups uh, and in fact in in the work we're doing with established businesses as well have chosen to keep purpose as a separate topic with a separate tool but then also recognize we then have to explain how that's connected to the business model um, yeah. So it, it would be really interesting to see to have some people have a do some work and and report on how is it when you add this stuff to to a canvas and and how do people react to that? Yeah, and and how we approached it on this was again towards the focus of organizational vision uh, uh, values, sorry, um, and. The reason we did that mostly was, yes, of course, there's personal values, and yes, of course, that informs it. From our perspective, especially because we were focusing on TNO Hesi and so on and so forth, it's here's defined values. They adopted the values from TNO. Um, so here's already defined values everyone subscribes to. So then how does it inform it? And that's where we saw the organizational layer uh, more specific. And then um, how I think that's relevant for whether or not you have it have those components, uh, sorry, have values as a component is, it seems more or different than things like purpose. Um, it, it, it kind of frames it differently, especially because they have, okay, our values to be transparent, um, our values to be focused on sustainability, for example. That, that's maybe not a good example of a value, but one of theirs was certainly uh, focused on transparency. Um, and that's where, because it's very specific, items, it, it seemed to inform the other elements, especially on alignment towards stakeholders. Um, could there be other ways of representing it? Could be outside? Um, could be. It just seemed like it's a very critical piece that could be easily missed. Again, that comes to the whole idea of, well, okay, you can say that for too, potentially too many things and you end up with this massive, complicated canvas that no one can use. Yeah. I, I'd say the biggest connection we saw was on stakeholders. And that's another kind of sub recommendation that was in there is in the stakeholders component make sure you also recognize the values of those stakeholders to try to get that alignment um, of course as the interviews completely mentioned you can't always get complete values alignment um, with everyone and if, especially if you're a startup company or a new company or delving into it and your top customer doesn't have perfect alignment uh, well sometimes you got to do what you got to do but um, especially when it comes to things like innovation people are recognizing how you can get a lot of success by having alignment of people. Yeah, it's it's it, this this was a point that that uh, I uncovered as well in my research originally, which is which is directly why value code destruction is on the flourishing business canvas, because it it doesn't matter how hard you're going to attempt to enable everybody to flourish, somebody's always going to have a point of view based on their values that says that they don't like what you're doing. And, and you may not think that's legitimate, but you can't deny that they have that different value, which is driving a different appreciation of what it is that you're doing. So they will sense that you're trying to destroy value for them. So, uh, I mean, there are many reasons why you, you may want to destroy value for somebody, like putting somebody out of business uh, because they're destroying the planet. But um, uh, you are all, always, um, the, what I always say is you, you're always going to find somebody who doesn't like what you're doing. Yeah. Um, the, and then, then the question for you is, as, as the the stakeholder of, that's trying to build the business, is what do you want to do about that? Yeah. Uh, and uh, but you're absolutely right. A lot of the time, you, there's nothing you can do about it other than be aware that they exist, so you can try and mitigate any damage that they could do to you. Uh, and then quickly responding to Simon's comment about different components of single projects. Uh, yeah, and, and again, in, interesting idea, uh, again, towards you don't want to make it too complex. I would just say as long as you really make sure to be aware that at least for this context, it seemed extremely important that values informs practically all of the components um, in your business model. Architecture. So just as long as you keep in mind that that is strongly connected, um, you need to keep in mind as you're 
developing each part. Does it align with your values? Does it fit with your stakeholders? Just keeping that in mind throughout. Yeah, if I can just um, speak really quick. You know, in terms of when we present the flourishing canvas, a lot of our clients are really asking us to help with values. The values is a very explicit part of the projects. And I think this part of your particular, sorry, this part of your presentation, really, really interesting. And, you know, there's many conversations to be had around this. Great to hear, Simon. Yeah, looking forward to talking about it. Um, I think one, the other... one of the sorry, I'm I'm talking over somebody. I'll shut up. Go ahead. No, no, that was me. So have at it. Uh, so I, I I remember one of the very early presentations we had to the group. I think it may have been back in 2012. Uh, was um was somebody who was who was also trying to approach everything from this values based perspective, and w one of the resources they shared at the time was was um. Or one of the concerns they brought up at the time, which we've not returned to since, is this question about the the ethics or, or the ethics of actually trying to influence people's values. Um, and um, uh, I remember back in in this original presentation uh, that they pointed us to the speaker pointed us to a resource from I think it was Oxfam in the UK, um, which because Oxfam obviously are out there trying to influence people's values in, in many respects. And um, it was very interesting because when I got a hold of that report, it, it basically said uh, uh, the, the golden rule that they, they suggested you follow if you're going to try and influence people's values is don't hide the fact that you're trying to influence their values. So as long as, as, long as you're being explicit about it and not making it a hidden subtext, uh, Oxfam's feeling was that that was that's basically okay to do it, but you have to tell people that that's what you're trying to do. I don't know, Simon, if, I mean, you're being asked to do it, so therefore you're being given explicit permission. But sometimes in our, I mean, we, we, sometimes in our work, you're not being asked, and yet you know that there's some shift in values that you need to, to try and get people to start to, to think yeah. about. Yeah, and in fact, we've actually had some really interesting questions, because um, as you know, in holonomics, we have a dynamic conception of wholeness. And one big philosophical issue is how can you tell the difference between identity and difference? How do you give something a singular identity while still respecting difference within that? So, uh, for example, some of, as you know, a lot of our clients are very large and they have many brands, you know, they have many sub companies. So how do you retain a subculture with that identity, um, sorry, without those differences? but still try and um, work with a single identity, which is like a holding company brand that really transmits confidence to uh, people, that transmits the fact that they're doing sustainability-related work, social work, or you know, that, or that an element of the brand is about social, positive social impact. So this is a very explicit conversation we have. And as I say, it's a big topic. I don't want to kind of hijack. Uh, the conversation but absolutely it is very explicit and that's why they'll, they'll sometimes come to Maria and myself and we create these gamification these various types of intervention to help get people on board who may kind of misunderstand what the overall aim is which ultimately is about improving the customer experience treating clients and everyone all stakeholders ethically with values yeah, it's, it's, a, it's another one of those areas that we definitely need some, uh, it, it's part of this culture question, um, which uh, ho hopefully in, in about a month month's time, we'll have some very exciting news to share with everybody about this culture uh, question and, and where this group might go next with, with that. And uh, Doug, we can chat about that afterwards as well, because I was reminded this afternoon, of course, that uh, Doug works, who's on, on the call today, uh, initiated this group's interest in culture at practically our first meeting. So this is, this has actually been a, a consistent interest, although we, we've not done as much in, in this area explicitly. It's been embedded in, in lots of the different projects of our members in lots of different ways. So anyway, Eric, back to you. Perfect. And maybe just building on the point from uh, Doug that he posted there is one of the reasons we thought it was important to is just having it 
really explicit because it, it definitely came up a lot of times on companies that have their values and then don't follow them. So I, putting the business model is potentially not the solution for that, but it, it, it does bring up the idea of this is a pretty fundamental thing. Maybe you do want it in front of people. So I, like you say, there, there's lots of pros and cons to it and direction to take. Um, so I, I, I think this is part of the, 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 the significant value of, of trying to do business modeling and this sort of purpose definition work. You have to do it as a group because you're, you're actually trying to influence the group uh, to, to better align their behavior with something that the group has agreed is important. Um, so it's, it's that, that, uh, that becomes vital. So um, the, the other main kind of recommendation that came out from this or conclusion is really trying to structure that guidance per component um, because there, there is some already, of course, in like we see it even in the business model canvas, we see it in the portion business canvas, we see it in uh, innovation kit. So it, every single one has guidance per component and such and very general questions to, answers, to, to answer. And I think one of the terms is necessary and sufficient questions. As far as I've seen them as we saw them, they're, they're quite generally based, right? It's questions for any company to answer. Um, and maybe just picking on a small example from the Flourishing Business Canvas, when we looked at it at first, um, we're an innovation center in the energy transition. Okay, we're a relatively small lab. Um, yeah, we use some electricity, we use some paper, so on and so forth. Uh, how, how important is it? I mean, we're not a big oil company, let alone a, a manufacturing facility or anything like that. Um, yes, we do still use some. So, okay, it is actually important to consider that uh, what we use because everyone has a cumulative effect, so on and so forth. Interestingly, though, um, something which was completely obvious in hindsight, um, but didn't really occur to us until we went through this process of figuring out the guidance from all the ingredients is we're connected to a whole bunch of people who are using our facility and we're helping guide them. Would it not seem a very important part of what we're doing then? Because we don't really have a value chain the same way, like we don't have supplier, like a couple pieces of equipment, so on and so forth. We kind of, we're kind of almost you know, meta level or whatever you want to call it, um, that these people who are using our facility, we can't be totally responsible for them in their own value chain, but we can certainly be providing education, information, helping them towards uh, things like reducing their use and reliance on biophysical stocks. So again, it kind of connected to the concept of being a leader. And um, I guess that was a common theme we thought saw throughout all the guidance for components is by giving that context specific guidance, um, it seemed to make it much more powerful for the organization to be able to realize how they should be understanding it. Again, there's some middle ground in there. You don't want, like, of course, you're not telling people exactly how to fill out their business model. But in terms of going, hey, you're this kind of company, you probably need to keep this in mind when you're answering the questions for this component. Um, a lot of it was completely obvious in hindsight. However, a lot of these are very new ideas and new terms. So having that first before getting in hindsight, I think would have helped us a lot in the business modeling process. And, and I hope this exercise would help companies in general on understanding how they can really understand these generic terms, generic ideas, specifically for their kind of company. Again, you don't get extremely specific. There's some middle ground in there, but I think it makes it much more usable for companies. Same concept applied for interrelationships. Um, and this, we didn't get that much discussion on interrelationships. Um, I think partially because it's just not considered too, too much in business modeling. Uh, of course, there's the idea of storytelling as introduced by it's in business model canvas, it's in fortune business canvas um, to try to represent interrelationships, but it doesn't explicitly appear in the canvases themselves. Um, and interestingly, I think what we came across is it's recognizing it's more than just links. So going, again, we can actually give guidance for those interrelationships. So you, you need to recognize it's a link and you know, <laughs> There's probably not enough recognition of that already. It's be good to do more. And we can even give guidance because if we're giving guidance for components and everything, you go, okay, well, if you're being a leader, okay, if you're giving education programs, so on and so forth, keep in mind 
as you're filling out your components for that, these are all linked together. And you know, who needs to be involved in education programs is an example for uh, your stakeholders um, and activities and partnerships. Um, and that's where this we thought could be beneficial to not only have the guidance for components and also have good guidance for um, interrelationships. Uh, this is recommendations um, more specific for, uh, again, types of companies in this context, um, as well as just, first of all, a, a general recommendation, which I think has become apparent already, but just to really consider this context specific guidance for architectures. Uh, and then just trying to summarize kind of from the themes before as well as the general guidance, uh, focusing again on being a leader, diversity, connections, and then recognizing you need to change as well. Because this is specifically for, an for a company in the energy transition, this is all happening very quickly. So you do need to be able to be uh, change adaptive, I guess, <laughs> able to change. Um, of course, applicable to many companies, but again, this is looking at just what's useful for this context itself. Uh, per the deeper discussion on values, I think we've covered most of it, but just recognizing the values and building the connections between everyone. Um, and uh, kind of just a general statement on things, but um, becoming a leader, uh, really taking this broader perspective, yeah, it's not going to be easy. We make no claims about it. And even the guidance throughout this overall research, and that, that's why this came up in conversation with interviewees as well, is all these concepts. I mean, this is not going to make life easier or simpler for people. However, especially because the organization is in the energy, energy transition and trying to accelerate it, uh, it seems pretty worthwhile to take on these new challenges and try to do better at making these changes happen. Uh, just a quick look back on the research itself. Um, I think end of the day, we did find something, especially because of the guidance that was a pretty good fit for um, innovation center and transition. So organization in this context. Um, an overall theme we found throughout is somewhere in there needs to be a balance because if you're extremely context specific and it's only usable by you know, Tino Hesi and that's the only one, well, this suddenly loses a lot of effectiveness for a lot of companies. And how do you learn from each other? If you make it too generic, well, you run into the same problem which kind of kicked off this research, which is how do we understand that? How is that relevant for us? Um, so there's some balance in there, not too general, not too specific, I guess, Goldilocks zone. Uh, just indicating a couple limitations of this research. First of all, is exploratory. So things like elements of context, um, those were the ones we identified from our interviews. I think there's a lot more that needs to be done on that. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and it was qualitative research. So of course, there is some subjectivity. Try to limit that through coding, so on and so forth. And additionally, a lot of people, uh, English was their second language. So we may have been through boats passing in the night and not realized it. So that was another factor. Um, in terms of how this is hopefully useful for other research and other contexts is hopefully, ideally, there's more research um, towards contexts and how it, uh, we can get guidance for it um, and the need for it. Um, and then that relates into the future research is coming up with that guidance. Now, um, this as well as, I guess, actually jumping to the, the last points is of recognizing the architecture and the foundation for it. There is quite a bit of research and we've had on previous SSBMG presentations about um, archetypes and, and business model patterns. Um, so I, for the purpose of the research, I didn't really look into it too much because they didn't seem to discuss the components and interrelationships very much. Um, so there could be more overlap that's not considered. And again, they, they didn't cover um, this context specifically. So. That, that's where I didn't get into it too much. A lot of it was still coming out. I think some of the articles have just been published recently. Uh, another factor though is, um, it, it's kind of looking at the guidance, but it, to me it appeared quite a broad level, uh, whereas this tried to focus a lot more per component, per interrelationship, and looking into the deep level of the uh, business model itself. So potentially pros and cons between the two. Um, I just, I also wonder when that guidance is provided without that view towards what are our 
again, the balanced scorecard perspectives, like are we, are we covering all the areas of the company? Are we really covering all the components? Are we looking at interrelationships? Um, I just, I wonder for that guidance if it could potentially be, be improved or done differently or thought of differently, or, or this could maybe be informed by it too, this research. Um, th there seems to be overlap and maybe ideas that can be developed. So, so just to, to uh, uh, completely agree with you, Eric, that um, there has been two streams of discussion, I would say, in the business model literature in general, not specific to sustainability uh, business models. Um, one of them is on what is a business model. Uh, and, and there are, as you noted, there are many, many definitions out there. There's no uh, agreed definition of what is a business model. And obviously we in this group have a particular view on what is a business model, i.e. it has to include all the, the, the context and all the implications of the context. Uh, and a lot of other people don't agree with that. So that's one stream. The other stream is, is on the components of business model. And there there's, um, it, 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 it's a much smaller body of work. Um, you know, Osterwalder was one of the first to try it. Um, there was a, for people who want to go into this in more detail, there were two, there was, there was um, uh, an academic paper and a full report done by Zot and Armit in 2011, uh, which was, uh, th this, this was the biggest piece of research that I saw on components looking at things from a profit first world view. Um, and um, I, I'm not, ter uh, and it was, this was, just, this was a meta review. It was a review of what everybody else had done. And that there have been one or two papers that have started to do this in the sustainability space. Um, uh, and, and I think of, so interesting to find those links. I think I've found about four in total. It, that's one of what the reasons that kicked off this research as well is the, um, my supervisor was looking into more components in general and I'm, I'm completely blanking on the names right now, but they came up with actually 50 different components. And then there have been other researchers who have also done reviews. What's that full listing of it? But yeah, uh, very uh, sustainability. Exactly. I suspect the 50 list is Zot, Zot and Amit's is, uh, list. And there's another paper that was just done uh, recently, and I'm struggling to remember the name of the author so I can look it up, but which was on a sustainability side of things. But it wasn't, it was another meta study, um, which was very interesting. But there was, but again, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't quite at the level of detail of components. It was somewhere, it, it was below the level of business model. It was kind of like the perspectives level, the sort of balanced scorecard uh, idea, that time, kind of level. Uh, but interestingly, it was, it had observations about, um, um, uh, let me see if I can just, I just think I remember the name of the author. Um, yes, here we go. Uh, this, this paper by um, Rodrigo Lozano um, is, is quite interesting. Um, oops, sorry, I just managed to conflate those two items. You'll have to split them out to make the links work. Uh, but that last paper has it for, for weakly sustainable, weak, weak and strong. Um, so it has, one of the interesting things, it has time in there and the implications of time, uh, which of course is, is a very challenging aspect of, of what we're trying to do here. Um, and um, it, it was one of, it's one of the few papers that start to acknowledge the importance of time. So I, I, I agree, Eric, because it's, it's one of those areas where, you know, uh, it, and, and we have the same thing with when Osterwalder did his original work, you know, over 15 years ago now, that um, it's hard work doing this component level of analysis. And so there isn't that actually that much of it going on. Um, so when people do publish stuff like Osterwalder and myself, um, it takes a long time for somebody to come along and critique it, which of course is the scientific process. Um, so yeah, it, when people like you come along and do studies at this level, it's, it's very, very helpful. Very, very helpful. Perfect. Uh, it so, glad that you agree. <laughs> um, I, I would claim mine is a very, very early phase on that. There, there's a lot of people who've done very detailed reviews on it. So. And I ended up landing towards already the existing. So, yeah, definitely seems like more work to be done on that. Um, one other thing I wanted to add in just quickly because I know we're running low on time is per the discussion earlier on uh, place issue 
and uh, a couple others you mentioned for the elements of contact. Um, I feel like there's a need for more research on that too, um, especially recognizing at least how I would understand or view something like place and then just comparing that with how I'm trying to define the idea of institutions um, is going, you know, the rural, urban, is it the place that makes a difference? Or is it things like your values and norms and lifestyle and habits that make a difference? So yes, obviously the two connect, maybe it's just an easier way of phrasing it. I just wonder, do we miss out on something um, by just thinking in terms of place rather than looking at what that represents? Um, perfect, thank you. So yeah, just, just commenting that when we're looking at elements of context, it could be interesting to see what else might be there. And that was it. Uh, so thank you everyone for uh, listening through all this and for the questions throughout and just if anyone else had other questions. I'll, um, I'll, I'll just uh, make a couple of uh, broader comments while, while uh, other people maybe put questions in the chat. Um, so uh, many, many of you uh, have been in the group for a while and so are well aware of this, others are, are new. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we want to promote in this group is uh, our ability to hear from um, our members at different levels of experience from different perspectives. And so uh, we, we've always been open not only to uh, senior practitioners and, and senior researchers, but also to uh, newer practitioners and newer researchers, because they often bring a fresh light to things that uh, those of us have been around for a while miss. And so we've always encouraged uh, graduate students and, uh, to, to come and present and share their work. Um, and uh, we've had many examples of this over the years. So uh, I, I'd like to thank Eric for, uh, you know, th this is somewhat scary thing perhaps for a, for a, a younger researcher or a younger practitioner to come and present to a group like this. So I wanted to acknowledge that, uh, you know, we try to create a friendly atmosphere uh, precisely because we do really want to hear from uh, people who are just coming into, into this space um, and share thinking. Uh, ho hopefully it, it was a, a friendly com comfortable atmosphere uh, to to share your work in and uh, for the rest of you if you know people who are doing research younger people who are doing research in this field or people who are new to the uh, to the field who would like to present to us then always very open to that possibility and I think Gil had a question uh, but didn't seem to come through uh, so, so, so uh, Gil, Gil, if I, if I may, uh, so Gil's asking the very relevant question: What's the relationship between this sort of academic, uh, um, more academically orientated um, work um, and practice? Uh, and Eric, maybe, maybe you want to comment on this from because TNO Hesse are obviously a very practical organisation. I mean, they're trying to get real things built in the real world and, and brought to market. Um, uh, and I, I would note, of course, this isn't pure theory, right? This is all very applied uh, uh, work. What, what, what would you say, Eric, was the relationship for your customer, in fact, for this research, which was Tiano Hesse? Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. So I, I, if I'm representing it correctly, at the end of the uh, research and everything was all finished with my um, my manager, Hank, who I dealt with most of the time, uh, he, he, I think in general represented that, again, looking at most of it in hindsight, it was um, fairly obvious. Um, and, and I think he also appreciated how it connected with an, an existing business model. And that, that was really one of the themes throughout, like, if we're going to really invent something totally new, like, well, let's be careful, because a lot of thought has gone into the existing things already built. So I, I think it was happy it connected with that. Um, however, even though it was obvious, he was also kind of glad of that because it showed, first of all, okay, well, that didn't occur to us at first. So, you know, hindsight 2020. Um, and second of all, 
now having shown that through research gives them a lot more confidence. Um, and I mean, this is just initial research on it, of course. Um, and there's still the importance of going out, testing it with customers, so on and so forth. But it's, it makes it, I think, a step forward for a company instead of just a complete guessing game. Like, okay, these are very general concepts. How do we recognize it for our company? So I think, it, I think that guidance can give a lot of reassurance. Eric, could you restate in just a sentence or two either the conclusion that you drew from this research or the hypothesis that you entered into it trying to test? Oh, perfect. Yeah. And you know what? Sorry, that's probably because I went through the Boil it down to, to the elevator pitch for me, if you would. Yeah, perfect. Thank so, you. Uh, apologies, everyone. I'll just do a quick elevator pitch uh, from the research question and then conclusions. So research question was pretty much, okay, we don't have something that seems to fit exactly right now. So let's really build a new architecture to see if we can come up with a better fit. Um, and that's looking at what's the components and interrelationships as well as what are the elements of context that would shape it. So the conclusion is, uh, okay, well, here's for this context anyways, what we found are the elements of context. The conclusion is, it looks like the flourishing business canvas plus debatable values component are a fit. And the continuing conclusion from that is saying, we also need beyond just the flourishing business canvas to give guidance for those um, components as well as for the interrelationships and we can give general guidance as well. Uh, the main things though, of course, guidance per component, guidance per relation, interrelationship and then recognizing what context we live in. Um, so I'd say that would be the main conclusions. And I guess the, the overarching conclusion that we think element, elements of context and context in general are important for business model architectures. So, so uh, I, I, as I discovered in my research, Gil, the, 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 the value is management teams and entrepreneurs need to know what questions are important and they need to know how those questions are interrelated because otherwise they spend way too much time answering, spending lots of trying to answer questions that are not important and don't answer questions that actually would make a difference. I think I would, I would summarize it that way as, as ultimately the value of, of trying to distill down a, a set of questions, a set of components, um, and the interrelationships between them. It's, it's to save practitioners time. And make it really understandable for those practitioners in that yeah. context. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, we, we're now just past the hour, so I, I want to respect our, our time. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, uh, based on the comments, I think uh, people found this very interesting and useful conversation. So thank you, Eric, for uh, sharing your work with us. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and you can all reach Eric through the LinkedIn group if you would like a follow-up conversation with him. I'm sure he'd be uh, keen to do that. Uh, next month, uh, we're still finalizing who our presenter is going to be next month. We're hoping it's going to be our members uh, who are policy analysts from the Flemish government uh, who have been doing research into uh, why aren't companies adopting uh, what they call green business. Uh, some of us, uh, myself included, have been involved uh, uh, along with other members with uh, this research project. Uh, that's been going on for about a year now. Uh, what we're not sure about is whether they've got, they're going to have their final report ready to share with us by this time next month. So uh, we're just trying to uh, figure that out. Uh, so it may be the Flemish government next month. Uh, it may be somebody else. Uh, but uh, um, in fact, it, it will probably be Kathy Porter if it's somebody else. Uh, and so uh, we um, uh, look forward to whichever those two it turns out uh, to be. So in the meantime, uh, have a uh, hopefully it'll be a little less wintry where we are next month uh, and uh, perhaps where you are too or coming towards the end of the summer if you're south of the equator. So have a wonderful month, everybody, and uh, see you all uh, same place next month. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you. So uh, Doug, Simon.